Um, here's a word that's worth adding to your vocabulary as, uh, as a Christian. And I have it up here on the screen. This word is eschatology. Right, kind of a technical, technical word, but it's, again, I think one worth uh, memorizing. And uh, this definition comes from the Holman Illustrated Bible Dictionary, and it says... Uh, eschatology derived from the combination of the Greek word eschatos, meaning last, and logos, meaning word or significance, refers to the biblical doctrine of last things. The doctrine of last things normally focuses on a discussion of the return of Christ at the end of the age, the coming judgments, various expressions of the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God, the nature of the glorified body, and the prospects for eternal destiny. And uh, I, I bring up this word because as we look at the end of Matthew chapter 24, uh, it's a context which uh, mainly deals with this topic, the topic of eschatology, or again, last things, final things. Um, so tonight I'm going to continue preaching through the text of Matthew, and I'm going to pick up with verses um, for, uh, 45 and following. So again, we're going to be in Matthew 24, if you'd like to follow along in your, in your own Bible. And we'll start with verses 45 and following tonight. So in these uh, verses, Jesus gives us a parable, right? I hope you all aren't sick of parables. You know, we've been uh, doing parables in our Sunday morning class. But uh, I'm, again, I'm just preaching through the whole uh, text of Matthew and uh, we find a parable here, so that's what we, we have here tonight. So in these verses, again, Jesus gives the parable of the watching householder. Uh, I've also heard people refer to this parable as the faithful servant and the unfaithful servant. And Jesus here teaches us about the importance of faith. He teaches us about His return. And He teaches us about the final judgment. So again, let's begin tonight in Matthew 24, starting with verse uh, 45. And here we read about the faithful and wise servant. The faithful and wise servant. So again, chapter Matthew 24, starting with verse 45. Christ says, Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household, to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. Right. So this is the first half of this, this parable. Jesus again speaks about this, um, this good servant. So here Jesus speaks about this man whose job it was to feed the household. And I'm going to refer to him as the cook Right. in the rest of tonight's uh, sermon. Um, for the sake of comparison, I'm reading the King James as I typically do, but in verse 45, a, a different translation says that this servant gave everyone food at the proper time. So again, whether he was a cook or some kind of uh, butler or something, I don't know, but you know, this man's job was to give people their food. Right? He gave them their food at the proper time. And again, I'm, I'm going I'm to refer to him as the cook. So what did Jesus say about the cook who fulfills his responsibilities? Well, look at verse 46 again. He says, Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find him so doing. Right? Again, so doing just simply means that this man, this servant, he's just doing his duties. He's doing what he's supposed to do. He's giving uh, his fellow servants and those of the household their, their three square meals a day. Right? He's providing the food that uh, they need. And, and simply by him doing what he's supposed to be doing, Jesus says that man is blessed. So here Jesus teaches that if you are fulfilling your responsibilities in the workplace, you're blessed. Uh, it's good and it's wholesome for people to have a good work ethic and to fulfill their duties in whatever, you know, whatever career they have. Now, as I mentioned before, the end of this, this chapter is about eschatology. Well, how does what we do what, how does what we do, what we do in the workplace, how does that relate to the end of time? Right? How does that re relate to es uh, eschatological things? Well, again, look at verse 47. Verse 47, Jesus says, Verily I say unto you, 
right? Uh, th- that's an important statement when we come across those in Scripture, right? If we kind of put that in today's lingo, Jesus is saying, you can take this to the bank, right? This is for sure. This is certain. Verily I say to you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods, right? So here's this faithful servant. The Lord finds him. The Lord sees he's a man of integrity. He's doing what he's supposed to be doing. And he gets a promotion. He gets elevated in his status as, uh, as, a, as a servant in that household. So the illustration here is of, when we look at the whole parable, we haven't seen it yet, but when we look at the whole parable, the illustration here is the Lord of this household, he leaves for a short time and then he returns. And when he returns, he finds the cook doing his work faithfully. Again, providing the food that everyone uh, needs. So this trustworthy servant is promoted because of his integrity, of his, of his good character. And so what you see there in verse 47 is the idea that he is rewarded. Uh, he is promoted for, again, his good, his good conduct. Um, the Bible says this about faith, but without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder, of them that diligently seek Him. Hebrews 11, verse 6. So Jesus here is teaching that men and women who are faithful in their secular work will have greater opportunities in heaven. Right? In some sense, if you have faith, and when you pass on, if you've done your work well, Jesus is going to give you a promotion. Uh, when Again, all things are, are consummated, when all things come to an end. And, you know, someone might look at this and say, well, this is a parable. Maybe I'm making this too literal. Well, no, there's other New Testament passages which are more literal that make the same point. The one Bart just read for us, we see virtually the same concept here in Colossians 3. Um, Notice here in Colossians 3, verses 23 and 25, it says, Whatsoever ye do, and in this context, that would include what we do as, as servants, what we do in our work as employees, Whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto man, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance. For ye serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong, excuse me, I got a frog in my throat. He that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. Right? So we're told whatever we do, whether it's, it's work or whatever, we are to do it heartily as to the Lord. And yes, we should care about our you know, work relationships, our fellow employees, our boss, and, and conduct ourselves well in those relationships. But as Christians, we should know our ultimate boss, so to say, so to speak, is Jesus. You know, at the end of the day, every single person is, is accountable to Him. And, and that's the point that's being made here. How we act out in the world, how we conduct ourselves in the workplace... Uh, Jesus will take that into to view uh, and consider that on the final day when we stand before Him and uh, give an account for ourselves. Right? So whether we do good, or as it says there in verse 25, whether someone's doing wrong, right? whether someone's doing evil things out in the world, that's going to play a role in, in that person's final judgment. So this parable in Matthew 24 and other verses uh, like Colossians 3 uh, these passages remind us that our faith as Christians, that should impact everything that we do, right? Whether we think about how we are to... Uh, thank you, Patrick. Thanks, I appreciate that, bud. Um, so you know, whether we're thinking about how we worship in the church, you know, spiritual matters, things like that, or how we behave out in the workplace, again, our faith, we ought to see our faith as influencing all those things. So next in in this passage, we read about the evil servant. So Jesus speaks about the faithful, wise servant. Uh, As we continue here in Matthew 24, He speaks about an evil servant. So Matthew 24, picking up with verse 48. But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken. The Lord of that servant shall come in that day when he looketh not for him in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, 
and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now you've probably heard the saying, when the cat's away, the mice will play, right? And uh, that's, a, that's a decent summary of verses 40 and following here. So here Jesus describes this wicked servant who says, well, hey, the, the boss isn't coming back soon. Let's just do whatever we want, right? That's, that's kind of the idea here. Um, and, and he begins to shirk his duties. Um, if you look at verse 49, it says he assaults his fellow servants. He beats them. And he eats and drinks with drunkards. So not only is he shirking his duties, but he's making things more difficult for everyone else in that household. You know, have you ever known someone, this is just for your own personal consideration, I'm not looking for any answers, but have you ever known someone who showed up to work drunk or under the influence or something, of something, hungover, whatever the case may be? Well, obviously, if someone's in that kind of condition, it's going to make the day harder for everyone else who works at that location, Right? Because if you're, if you're doing your job and how you do your job is affected by how this person is doing their job over there and this person's, you know, sick and barely, you know, with it, well, obviously that's going to make your day more difficult. And uh, this is the kind of thing Jesus is describing here at the end of verse 49, just to use one word, belligerent, right? This man is belligerent. He's, he's beating his fellow servants. He's you know, carousing around with a bunch of drunk people. He, he's, not doing, he's not doing anything that's going to help others and be beneficial to others in that, that setting. Now, in verse 50, we find a point that is made several times in this chapter. And if you're taking notes tonight, I would uh, suggest to you that you jot down these references. These are all Matthew 24, uh, verse 36, 39, 42, 44, and verse 50. Let's uh, quickly um, read these, these verses together. Um, so, again, just to repeat, this chapter does speak about the destruction of Jerusalem all the way up through verse 35. In verse 35, Jesus says, Heaven and earth shall, or, yeah, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Uh, what, what words is he talking about? His prophecy about the destruction of Jerusalem. If you back up one verse to verse 34, he says, This generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. And that's the key to understanding this chapter. Everything he says before verse 34, verses 1 through 34, all that was fulfilled in that generation Jesus spoke with. So verses 36 and onward, he begins speaking about eschatology, the eschaton, right? The consummation of all things, the end of all things. So look at verse 36. He says, But of that day and hour knoweth no man. And again, notice how extremely specific he is. No, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Right? That's pretty specific. Uh, verse 39. Here he's talking about the flood and using the flood as an example of God's judgment in the past. Verse 39, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also coming, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Uh, verse 42, watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. Verse 44, therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. And then we have verse 50 in our context tonight, our passage tonight, verse 50. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of. So Jesus teaches his return will be unexpected, unknown by everyone, except for God the Father. This is something that only God the Father uh, knows. And he repeats this five times in this passage. Hippolytus was an early Christian, and he predicted that Jesus would return, and thus the world would end in the year 500. 
There was a Baptist preacher named William Miller who lived in the 1800s. He predicted Jesus Christ would return to earth on October 22, 1844. People called his failed prediction the Great Disappointment. And you can read about him on, on Wikipedia and other uh, resources like the Encyclopedia Britannica. Just do a quick search for William Miller. And apparently, there's a lot of people who followed him. They're called Millerites. So that's quite a, quite a movement in its time. The Jehovah's Witnesses organization, uh, it has predicted that the world would end in the year 1914. But when that didn't happen, they said, well, no, it's 1918. And when that didn't happen, they predicted the world would end in 1925. And then in 1975, and again, I just encourage you to do your own research. You can do five minutes. Go to a, a search engine online, type in Jehovah's Witness predictions about the end of the world. And you can find information to read about that. Interestingly, JWs no longer make predictions about the end of the world. I wonder why that is. Uh, if you recall, in the early 2010s, uh, people were talking about whether the world were, would end. Why? Well, because there is an ancient Mayan calendar, and this calendar ended on December 21st, 2012. We're still here, right? I'm still here. I hope you're here with me. Right? The world has not ended. Here's uh, an article that was put out by ABC News. And the headline reads, 2012, End of the World Countdown, based on Mayan calendar, starts today. Right? Kind of makes me, the way it's phrased makes me like think we should have like a bucket of popcorn or something, you know, waiting for the final countdown. Right? It's the final countdown, as the song says, I guess. Well, you know, dozens and dozens of people have predicted that the world will end on a specific day. And uh, kind of setting you know, humor aside, the sad reality is there's people who get swept up in this kind of thing, <clears throat> who are sold on these false predictions, and when they realize that they're false, uh, many people lose their faith. They become disillusioned by this kind of thing because they realize they've been lied to. And so we should be very careful when we talk to be people about things we cannot be certain about. And we should never be the cause that someone loses uh, their faith. In Matthew 24, Jesus says five times in a row that no one can know when the world will end. He will return in a day when it's not expected and in an hour of which people are unaware. So let's trust in Jesus' words and speak the truth in a loving way to our friends and our family members who get swept up in these end-of-the-world predictions. Again, repeatedly Jesus says here, people cannot know when the world will end. And you know all these predictions, it's interesting, I, I, in my free time this afternoon I was, I was reading more about some of these things. You know, Hippolytus, that early Christian I mentioned, he based his date on the end of the world on the measurements of the ark. And so this is a man, he's a Christian who lived, you know, in the uh, you know, first, um, uh, I forget how many hundreds of years, but he had the entire Bible. He had the Old Testament and the New Testament. And you would think he would care more about this plain passage where Jesus says repeatedly, you know, only the Father knows, instead of going to the ark and saying, well, this measurement means this, and this measurement means this many years. It makes no sense. You know, we have, we have to use the Bible correctly and understand it correctly. So, Jesus does, again, speak about final things. He does speak about final ju uh, judgment, rewards and punishment. But, again, when all that takes place, we can't know that in, in our time, in our, our age. Uh, it's going to be unexpected. Now, as we look at the, the final verse here in our context, verse 51, Jesus describes the punishment of that wicked servant in His parable. You know, if God is good, then He must also care about justice. Right? A good God would not allow rapists, murderers, thieves, and criminals, and so on to go unpunished or even reward that kind of behavior and that kind of lifestyle. That would, be, that would not be good. 
So again, if God is good, then He must care about justice. And if God is just, then He must punish those who deserve punishment. The doctrine of hell can be an unpleasing, uh, unpleasing thing to, to think about. Hell can be summarized as just deserts. And I would encourage you as, you as you think about what the Bible teaches about hell, uh, I'd say that's a basic and fair way to think about it. It is just deserts. God in His omniscience will carry out justice on those who deserve it, and their sentence will be fair. God has given us the principle of an eye for an eye. Right? That's found back in Exodus 21, verse 24, and other Old Testament passages. An eye for an eye. In today's language, we would say something like, the punishment must fit the crime. The severity of punishment should correspond to the severity of the offense. For example, no one's going to receive the death penalty for stealing a pack of gum. Now, stealing gum, of course, is wrong. That's not a good thing. But we all understand that you wouldn't do that to someone. That's, that, that punishment is way too severe for such a small offense. So God expects us to carry out judgment in a fair way as we conduct ourselves in a civil society and there's laws and unfortunately people break those laws. That's the whole purpose of the eye for an eye. Again, the punishment must fit the crime. If God expects humanity to carry out justice fairly, then how much more will He be fair when He judges the world? There is honor in practical and ordinary duties of life. Again, Jesus used a cook to exemplify a servant who is faithful and wise. You know, whatever you do for a living, if you do your work with integrity, that is an honorable thing, a good thing. If a person is a carpenter or a teacher or a factory worker, a truck driver, a cook, right? it doesn't matter whatever we do, Again, if we're doing things heartily to the Lord, again, God holds that person in esteem for the work that he does or she does. You know, life can, I think, sometimes feel uh, mundane, you know, feel like we kind of get stuck in a rut sometimes, uh, or going through the same motions week in and week out. Um, Not only does Jesus remind you that there's honor in carrying out your daily obligations, but you should think about your actions, whether, again, it's at work, or in your family, or in church, or whatever. We should think about all our actions in a view of a final judgment and us passing on from this world. How you conduct yourself and your work and your everyday affairs will play a part in the eschaton, again, in the consummation of all things. Let us be like that faithful servant. He fulfilled his duties. He served those in his household. The Lord was pleased with His integrity, rewarding Him for His good character. May the evil servant in this story serve as a cautionary tale. And let us think about his fate soberly. Let's strive to be men and women of character, glorifying God in everything that we do. And so tonight, if you're not ready for that final day of judgment, um, again, we have no idea when Christ is going to return. We're promised He will return one day. And so we should just always be ready. We should, again, live life expecting that, uh, again, He could return any time, right? And even if He doesn't return in our lifetime, the Bible promises one day we will stand before Him uh, and give an account. And let us be ready for that day. And so if you have not yet received Jesus Christ and received the remission of sins, we encourage you to believe in Him, uh, confess your faith in Him, um, put Him on in baptism, and uh, become a follower of Him uh, today. Uh, If you need any kind of encouragement or prayers from from the congregation, please let us know by coming forward as we stand and as we sing.